<clears throat> and so what is really nice to do when we come down into this region and from black robots you know, and to talk to groups of individuals that you know for the most part has lived you know and and taken root into an area indigenous to this region uh, since before the last glacier period, right? You know, it's called the Driftless area. The well, whole chunk, you know, I traditionally also call this area, you know, a place of refuge. You know, this is where my ancestors, this is where our ancestors had to reside for a certain amount of time until that last glacier that began to recede north again, you know, allowed us to go back into our place of ancestral origin, a place called Mogashunch, which is Red Banks. <clears throat> now, uh, the main reason I have a PowerPoint for this, kids hate them, they detest them. I grew up around four points when I first uh, transferred into a, a department there that was using slides, right? You know, and or talking 99% orally, and very little of that being absorbed by who they talk to. Because what was interesting about our old, you know, divisional folks that would go out there to speak to the public, they had the luxury they could walk right back on into the same area a couple of years later and say the exact same speech, and nobody remembered any of it hardly. That was pretty good. But I can't do that nowadays because we tend to throw a few more words. You know, written down in there. People tend to video and audio tape and whatever tape they do. Um, but that said, you know, they always say a picture's worth a thousand words, right? And so, but if you see an image of our ancestral layers that we um, we could call home, ever since we we're placed in a, a you know this area that I just mentioned, Mogashuch, you know, the Red Banks area is where that. <laughs> great football team today in our size, right? Green Bay Packers. But that said, when that glacier was here, we had to have a place of refuge to stay in because you don't live on top of ice as people, right? Eskimos tend to enjoy that and then stuff like that and, and so be it. But most generally, you live alongside it or far enough away for it so that you could, you know, live comfortably. And I'll, what a lot of people don't tend to do is stop to take note and think, you know, what was it like to be here 10 to 12,000 years ago? You know, you're going to have an archaeologist <clears throat> come here in several weeks. He's been here several years ago, here, same room, talking about, and if he were president for that, he talked about all oh, the effigy mounds that was over by bad acts and then these bears and coolies that they're now doing some more further research on that. They have the ability to take this electronic process of imagery what we call LIDAR, where a plane flies over and takes a thousand scans a second, you know, of the terrain, and they can pull those images and put them together, all those little data set files, and they can create a 3D version of the ground, and right through the woods, right around the fields, right around your farms and everything. But in doing so, they're able to read that ground to see if, in fact, there are anomalies out there, earthworks, right? And archaeologists, they tend to love to see earthworks. And when I'm talking about earthworks, I'm talking about conical mounds, and linear mounds, and effigy mounds, and you know, and different types of uh, man-made earthworks that stretch back several thousand years. And he talks about that period. And I know him well, Ernie Bozart, we work alongside each other out there and in, in, in different you know, walks of life there, we're trying to protect and preserve, and thus perpetuate our history of man in this area. Or else we wouldn't be out here in the evenings, you know. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> I kind of like it anyway, so I'd be out here anyway. Um, but I guess in short, you know, we take the time to make sure everything we want we say is done in an accurate way. He does the exact same thing, but he does it at a scientific level. <clears throat> but that driftless theory that was in here, when that glacier came down here and he created all this, and as it receded around here, um, he created all this water, that these streams that you see today. And as you're growing up, You've probably seen the environment change even in your own, you know, farms and areas there. The stream's a little wider, a little more shallower, this, this, and that. Um, a hill's gone, right? Nowadays we have modern mechanization out there so we can move whole hills. And we can create fake wetlands up there and fill them on over here. I want a house over here on top of this hill so I'll level it off and, the, and that wetland down there would be better if it was prairie grass to still fill it in. And, and we tend to play God a little bit more than we should. And 
you know, grandmother Earth, she doesn't take to that very well. She has her own ways, right? She'll do what she wants to do, really, whether we're here or not, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That said, we tend to shape, you know, her to the degree that it becomes adverse to us. I mean, how many cities do you see flooding, for example, right now? And a lot of people will blame climate change. Well, blame her. Blame where you're building these structures, right? There's not an area out here where you'll find effigy mounds unless we've dammed up a river, unless we've went out there and pulled off an area and removed it by hand, you know, unless we go over there and want a pool in the backyard where there's a conical mound, we're the ones changing where these effigy mounds were. They were placed there for the purpose, they were placed there so Mother Earth would take care of them for who knows how long. And yet now we ourselves are destroying them as human society. That said, I put this map up here. Because this, this is a territory that is described, described through oral tradition. The whole chunk nation has, just like any other government, we have our right, our, we have our general public, you know, general council, we call it. Uh, it's we the people, we have that same thing in Washington, right? Every single one of you can go to Washington today because that's how democracy works. You can go over there and if you're mad with your, you know, leaders, you can tell them that. And if you get enough of you, man, you can pull them out of there and put someone new in there. That's how it's supposed to work. We the people. And then you got the legislators, right? And we have the same government that tried to do it. They kind of emulate the current government in Washington so that we can control and govern ourselves. And so we can assume sovereign responsibilities as a tribal government to assist our people. You know, there's a population of Ho-Chunk, not only in Wisconsin, but pretty much throughout the whole world. You know, I think the number is around 7,500. And we formed our government you know, in order to, to better take care of ourselves and our, our own needs. So back to this, though. We talk about origin and stories and how we we do a lot of our processes orally tell stories we don't really rely on written language very much nor do we really believe that this is where we should put all our eggs in the basket you know, there's a time you know that even just on the other side of the earth here you know back in the 40s there was one group of people trying to totally destroy another team of people right? they didn't want me to say that <laughs> they were. They were putting them up in fence pens and they were destroying them, burning them, killing them. And they were trying to wipe them off the face of this earth. They were taking all their books, all their literature that even cited that group of people, putting them in the streets and burning them. And if it had been some for somebody stopping that process, they wouldn't be here today. And so that's how close you are to destroying a whole culture. You get away with, you know, get rid of them. And you get rid of their written language about them, and pretty soon history tends to be changed by the people that are doing that. So we don't rely too much on this process right in here. The stories, the stories we use to talk about this area just tell that we are connected to this area. Ever since our first fires were lit here, we were placed there by our creator. You know, that takes us back to several generations several glaciers before they actually say only to be pushed off temporarily and then to go back and it changed the environment so much you know that a lot of our stories in between that period and present here relate to the environmental change that has taken place within, within our within our history and yet sometimes it's hard to comprehend that period of time so what I kind of like to do sometimes, and to see if I can do it this way. Yeah, I can do it this way. If I can get the shortest lady here, and don't all raise your hand at once. I mean, it sounds good. I'm going to take this lady right up here. And so you're going to stand right here. I'm not picking on you, but I have to talk over the top of her, and I don't like doing any of this, so I'm going to talk around you a little bit. But if you can take your fist and put it right in there, like that. Okay. I'm going to take this lady back here. Yep, you. Yep, you're the lady, come on. <laughs> now we're gonna have to stay in here for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> you're gonna write in line with her shoulder, you're gonna put this fist up here, just like this, okay? You're going to stand right here. Right about here, it's one arm length. Right about here. 
right, you stand right in front of this line and you're gonna put that fist right in front of me, you're gonna hold that up there, you know. Power to the people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and here's, this is a timeline I'm creating, creating here now. And so I'm gonna take that lady in the corner since she's sitting over here, if you can stand right up. Here, right, in. And from here, you're going, you're gonna just put your fist up right next to her, right over here. Right next to her, though. Oh. Yep, and everybody step forward to the crowd a little bit so, because I have a big belly. <laughs> okay, so the last person, that lady sitting out there in the red, yeah, if you can actually, you don't have to, if you can walk that way to the other side of the building, and on the wall, and she's going to represent 50 feet from this point right here, 50 whole feet. So this is cool. No, okay, so they don't have to touch. Uh, you're just going to put it, you're going to put it right straight ahead of you, and you're going to put this right about here, just like that. Yep, you're just going to try and keep 12 inches apart of you. Like that. Just a little fist, smaller or better. Okay, what this is going to be, this lady here, I'm not trying to touch it, touch it, I'm just touching it. Um, what this is, is this is 2019, so even from this point on, if anybody knows her and you see her at the grocery store, say, hey, this is Miss 2019. That's her. But she's also 1492, okay? And somebody sailed the blue. 1492 to 2019. This is the timeline now that most history books will talk about. You know, Christopher Columbus, Jean Nicolay in 1634 stepped ashore in Green Bay right here. And the first people encountered was Ho Chunk. You'll hear it in the history books and you see the manuscripts of Winnebago people. Well, this is what other tribes called us, the Winnebago people. But he stepped ashore and he met my ancestors right there, right about the. 1634, 1700s, the British, you guys know all your history, uh, 1800s, Americans, right? And then 1848 became a state, 1900s, that's when, I think 1901, wasn't it Trump was born? I don't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> this might not be the right crowd to be talking to about Trump. Okay, so anyway, anyway, so he was born somewhere in this nasty period of time. And so anyway, so this is the historic period. Every history teacher out there will talk about the historic periods. And then this is prehistory. And it's so funny because it is a prehistory. Because man has history and we have stories that, and proof positive that man was here all the way back to the last glacier period. That archaeologist that's coming here, that whatever always says he says he is that week, he's going to hold up arrowheads. And he's going to talk about this Clovis point that takes you back 12,000 years Time the mastodon, the short faced bear, and all these big giant animals were in this area, right? And these are the tools that they used to harvest those animals back then, because everybody knew where Boaz is. Everybody heard about the mastodon was found. There was tools and cut marks on those bones and stuff like that. Somebody harvested that mastodon that were extinct, you know, not so far after that. And somebody was there. And that somebody was there with my ancestors, you know, Native American people. Okay. okay, you're getting very lazy on me, girl. <laughs> <laughs> this date is important. This is 0 AD, or BC, whatever you want to call it, right? It's a very important date on this 50-foot rope that goes all the way back to the last glacier period. And you know why this date's so important? I'll give you one guess. Well, there's a lot of guesses. <laughs> well, they said this great man walked this earth for a short period of time on the other side of this earth, and it, it made such an impact on mankind that our calendars are based off of that, beliefs are based off of that process, and if he lived here or not, there's still a lot of effect that it caused over in here. Manifest destiny, you hear about that? You know, this God-given right, this land is our destiny to take. This is based off this zero right here. On the other side of the zero, we have a drifting mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. And this should be closer, right about okay. here. 300 BCE, all the way up to about 1400 AD. That individual that's coming here in a couple weeks to talk about archaeology, they talk about the effigy mounds that were placed here on this earth during this period of time here. It's important to know that there was a culture that had the ability to think and the foresight to place these effigy mounds in areas that last 2,000 years, right? You don't hear of cultures, of societies, of people placing something that can last the duration of time without it becoming rubble. That isn't something built upon top of it. 
And so this history we have in Wisconsin, oh yeah, she's, she's prior than you think. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I, I can set zero down now. Let's set zero down. I'm gonna set down Miss 2019 real quick. You're gonna be here for the duration of the event. I'm gonna be here for the doors are closed. Uh, so, but this 300 A BCE period, all the way up to this 15 or 1400 AD, is a period those effigy mounds were being put in. There was a culture, and there was a people, you know, that was alive and vibrant and living here. They weren't living hand to mouth. I mean, if you're living hand to mouth and trying to survive, you know, you're not out there making babies, right? You know, you're not out there practicing your culture, your ways of life out there. So they must have had a pretty good life after all, right? They lived here and they were comfortable and they excelled and they had a great population doing this process. Because in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, from Green Bay, basically roughly over to the Nicha Day over here, the big river, Mississippi, right? Everybody knows the old chunk word for that. All the way down to the Illinois River, over here to Gooch Gaithanak, that's Skunk's Village over there. <laughs> Did it? Yeah, I believe, kid you not. Now, there's every tribe that comes through there, resides or stays there for a while, they have their own version of name, but it has to refer to the, the smelliness of that area. And it's because it's not nothing bad. You know, the wetlands and the prairies or where the plants are around there, there was a lot of skunk cabbage and that like over there. Garlic, wild garlic, right? And it's still a big part of that. If you allowed it to grow, that was why that village area was called that. You know, this Daishi shit kill out here, bad waters out here. That whole area through here was just a metropolis of people. Astalon, you hear about that? Cahokia, right? Trempolo area here. People wanted to desire to get up into what we, back then, referred to, for lack of a better term, God's country too. Everybody talk about that. Oh, Wisconsin is God's country. Well, it is. It's very valuable. It has everything you needed more. The growing area through here gives you four seasons. I love that. I went down to Florida and, and almost unloved it <laughs> this last winter. But I come back. And and I love the four seasons. I, I don't mind the average snow. I don't I average the spring and falls are beautiful, right? We're up there just getting done sugar bushing. Who's sugar bushes in here? Yeah, right on, man. What are you doing here? No. So it's raining out there. And so um, but but in short, this is a beautiful area to live. Our ancestors loved it. They preferred to live here. And that's why when we talk about our history, it talks about the historic period, 1492. You know, even then the Spaniards already, we had heard telltale signs after that, them coming up and exploring all the way up to the Kaoki area. And we went down, the Ho-Chan people, you can find this in manuscripts out there, talking about how we went down there and we had killed a band of Spaniards and brought 50 horses back into the Wisconsin area and didn't have the need for them, so we ate them. You know, so that history already begins with other groups of people. We only read about the French. You know? We always say the whole time when they first met them on here, we put on feasts and stuff on there. Because we already heard the tribes from the East coming this way from pressure and they were bringing these metals that we weren't familiar with, so we're anxious. You know, to see where they're getting them just as anxious as, you know, not. And because we didn't have those tools. We didn't have the knives. We didn't have the powders and stuff that was coming along with that. And once they came here, life became better for us for a short period of time. The French, like I say, maybe I didn't say it to this group, I'm scared. <laughs> you know, the French were lovers and they weren't fighters. They didn't want to take your land. They wanted to take everything from that land, you know, and you wanted to trade with them to do that. The hides and pelts was their claim to fame. But they were looking for a passage to the Orient and they had heard from the East about these people, you know, that were seafaring people. When they were talking with the French, and the French were talking to the Algonquins, they talked about these people of the big waters. The French mistook that as seafaring people. And so they were anxious, thinking they've now found the Orients. And when they came, and they you know, set their boats ashore there, and they ran into the Ho-Chunk or Winnebago that time, um, they talk about this Damascus Road. I have a little story about that road, by the way. Um, but he let off these fire sticks 
And that was our initial contact. He went back, came back several months later, and found a little longer. And we put on um, several feasts for him and his entourage that came with him. And that established the tie to the whole junk, or Winnebago, in 1634 and on. <clears throat> that, if you would read, this is an artist's rendition, this is not a picture, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> but the artist's rendition, he has a few things wrong, but for the most part, that Winnebago are talking to this, you know, the French with the Algonquin guides, right? And I, we, when I talked to my whole chunk of youth and groups like that, we said, man, if you could read between the lines or listen between the lines, right? And <laughs> you can see, oh, there was the neighborhood is what it should have been. <laughs> there, but that didn't take place at all. Because we were kind of eager for the same process to take place initially. The, uh, we talked, and I, I think he gave me an hour or until his battery runs out. <laughs> and the uh, 1634 on is the history that everybody kind of learns about, right? The French, how they came here and traded, only to have problems with the British coming into this area. And, and so the French, you know, didn't need forts so much, but the British did. So you see those forts that were in Green Bay, Portage, Perichine, all these forts or these trading posts, you know, went into British, you know, hands. And then ultimately to the Americans that came here and pushed the British on. So you know, it's a lot, a lot of, a lot of really boring reading to me. But it affects us too because during that whole process on there, um, you forget to talk about the indigenous peoples here in that history book until you get to you know the American and the Native American or you know, the Indian War as they call them. Uh, all you hear about SAC, you know, SAC and Fox, Chief Black Hawk, Black Hawk War, a lot. The, um, I told you about the French coming, life was good. You know, the 1700s, because of stuff that was going out east there, it became a very busy place in Wisconsin here. A lot of those eastern tribes, the Kickapoo, the SAC and Fox, right, Miami, you know, Illinois is already you know, almost wiped, wiped out. Um, but all these tribes are being forced into an area, and then you can only put so many people that lives off, you know, the environment around you into a small area. And uh, along with this and the Americans and the British came a lot of disease, right, and a lot of warfare. So we lost a lot of our population, the Ho-Chunk did, through this process on here. And uh, it became a very popular place. Um, but after the Americans had pushed the British out and, and uh, uh, decided that this land was good, um, they decided to allow the pioneers and, and all those people come here to research to see what's on the property, right? The, the long wood barons, or what they call them, pine baron, barons, pineries. Um, the lead was a very important thing for this area, the Lena area. In fact, you see in our treaties later that it's exempt from treaties because it was so important for the American government to have it. They didn't want nobody taking the chance of saying this is ours. So you see an exempt process almost on that. <clears throat> the, um, but after that dust clears, and in 1816, they decided, since there were still factions of tribes, you know, warring about, you know, in this area here too, because it was just like, I don't know what the term would be on here. They're all pushed around, you know, and and they were just the victims of the you know times at that time. So you had the Ojibwe's up the north, Menominee, the Ho Chunk, and a lot of those tribes that are still crammed into this area. And the U.S. government had to do something about that. And in 1816, there was this uh, this treaty that was created, a Treaty of Peace, right? and everybody can read this in books. And the Treaty of Peace basically was the government's attempt to see if tribes would, in fact, lay claim to areas of their own and sign that treaty with an X on it. You know? <clears throat> and they did. Well, Chunk was right along the Nami, Ojibwe, and all these other tribes signing these treaties to say, I'll stay in my little block of the area, you stay in your block of the area, and all will be good. And the government kind of assured back then, you know, that, uh, I think I can put it on the next one. Well, they, they had promised that they would stay out of our area if we stayed out of theirs. That's basically, in a nutshell, what a treaty is. You know, you stay on that side of the river, we we'll stay on ours. But that was never the case. And you oftentimes read about those treaties, and the breaking of those treaties is 
because of duress, you know, we kept on going back to our, our, you know, our father in Washington. You always hear these stereotypical terms, and but they talk about how we go back and we'd have these, uh, you know, agencies established in our area there that would try to keep the peace for us, really, and and they realized that it wasn't working very well. But every time we went there to negotiate, a, you know, or talk about the treaties, or they came to us to talk about those treaties. We, they never increased the land. They always took away more. And through the treaties process there, you know, even though they recognized the sovereign nation because we put that X on there, they decided to take away what makes the livelihood of, of tribes, you know, function or their cultural work. And that's, you know, expansive land. And so they vowed to stay out, but they didn't. And so the treaty era, in effect, took, took hold and through a series of treaties for the Ho Chunk, for example, you, you can see all this was indigenous areas at one time wanted to resort it down to what the BIA recognizes on a map here of, of tribal trust lands. So there's a lot of land taking, right? But anyway, a series of treaties between 1825 and 1837 took place, and it reversed the position of us holding land in our ancestral areas, this side of Mississippi, at least in the Wisconsin area. And it that's when they forced the Ho-Chunk to turn over all their lands and vacate our area west of the Mississippi onto a reservation they had created. And so that is when effectively the removal periods began for the Ho-Chunk people. Now, at this time, you guys can begin crying or you can hang on to it till after this whole presentation is done. <laughs> you don't have to cry. The removal, removal. <laughs> Some don't like me. <clears throat> so the removal periods um, began for us. And you hear about the Cherokee Trail of Tears, Potawatomi has a Trail of Tears, well, Little Chunk has a Trail of Tears. We lost over 1,600 to 1,700 individuals in these series of removals alone. That's a lot of people lost out of our population when it had already been decimated from the disease and warfare that was taking place. In 1846, they removed all the Winnebago's formally to what they call the neutral grounds through the Sack of Fox and the Jibwe, over there to Turkey River area. That, that move over there is just across the river, you know, and really, what is that river, you know, when people wanted to get back? It's so easy to get across that Mississippi River, isn't it, with your elders and your youth and everybody? And, but that's what we did. We kept coming back from Turkey River over here, some stayed. You know, because for fear of getting wiped off this earth, others kept coming back here and it became such an issue, you know, that the government decided to remove us from Turkey River and move us a little further. And what they did is they moved us up into a place, and I don't see this is on here, they moved us to a place called Long Prairie, Minnesota. Anyway, well, that needs to be put on there. I, I made this too. So, Anyway, let's do a picture, that's a little easier. They ceded our territory that we had signed off here, moved us here initially, and so this is a better perspective of the historic periods. So we kept coming back and hiding out amongst you know, the areas where the pioneers kept complaining, the frontiersmen, and the military to take us back under gun. Who knows where uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin is? Yeah, right on. <laughs> no more GPS for you. So, <clears throat> over there on their courthouse floor, if you walk around there, they've got these cement, you know, images embedded on that courthouse wall of the history that they're proud of, of Saul Coney. And if you look on there, one of their images is a big cement slab over there where they show all these Ho-Chunk that are at guns point and they're putting them on boats and moving them off out of this territory, out to the west. And this is one of their parts of history that they put on that wall. And I sat on a, I sat on an ad hoc committee one time talking about tourism and trade because they didn't like this, you know, all the money going to the casino. They wanted to spread it down through El Sauk County. Long story short, I sat next to a guy named Mark Eagle, super nice old guy. He used to be a township chair. And I said, Mark, I said, yeah, I can't believe they put them stone things on there, and they're 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 proud of the fact they they removed a whole group of people here just for another group of people coming here. He goes, yeah. 
He goes, well, that's just the way it is, I guess. You, he's got to document, and this is interesting, you have to document history the way it was, right? That's always the case. History doesn't change, we tell the story. So just remember that. You can't change history. You can just tell the way, change, tell the story different. So at that committee, though, I had talked to them, and there's this individual, I, was, I always go back to our traditional courts and ask them direction. Uh, we, it's a good thing to go ask your elders. And you know, they've been around a little longer, they're supposed to be wise, or wiser. And there's this individual, his name was Jim Funmaker, passed away now, but 90 some at the time, though. And I asked Jim one day, I says, you know, I would go to this ad hoc committee down there, and they talk about, you know, how it's so important, you know, to really talk about the history on there, but they're reluctant to talk about our history. In fact, I said on this courthouse wall, they got this stone mural up there of the whole chunk being placed on these, they were removed by guns, I says. He says, he goes, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. He goes like that. I would just love to be alive if they ever removed that stone mural off that building. That'd be a great day. Because we were talking about Yellow Thunder and all the history of this talk. I was asking him about Sock County. He goes, I'd like to be alive when that's removed. And so I told that to that committee. I said, you know, and I was sitting there and it says, I have an elder named Jim Funmaker. I'm going to tell you what he told me. He would love to be, he'd love to see that stove removed before he passed away. And they said, oh, well, we didn't, none of them, well, some of them didn't even know it was there, but most of them worked in that building. They knew it was there. And it was kind of in past tense, you know, okay, yeah, well, the worst kind of stand task. And oh, by the way, I said he's 96 years old, you know, and, and some fun makers, they can live to be 100 or so, you know, which is good. You know? So we had a little time to work on it, but we never got it done. But I bring that up because it talks about the removal of Ho Chunk in here, and in fact, that is part of all of our history. You know, that I, you know, you can't look at it bad or good or whatever, but we can learn from our history. They always say it's things go in a circle, right? You know, our history should be the same. You should always learn from your mistakes in your history, so you're or otherwise you're destined to repeat it. They say. I hope not. So after they moved us here, they found that it was not feasible to keep dragging them back across and dumping them off here. They moved us to Long Prairie up here. Uh, uh, and, and you take an agricultural type tribe, and Ernie will talk about that right here, and then when those mounds are being placed on here, agriculture has just become the king in this area. You want to learn where your agriculture um, developed or originated from in Wisconsin? <coughs> talk to the whole time. They brought the first corn into this area. They brought the different plants and they had to adapt it to grow in this area down here because we picked it up from forks from the south and adapted it up in here. Now you can grow corn overnight, it seems like, right? Uh, but it wasn't always the case, and the corn we brought up here was more of an eating type corn. We still use it to this day, you know, at, at great cost. It takes for us to plant this corn exempt or away from other corn, so it doesn't mix in with your field corn type stuff, you know. But it's, it's highly valued corn because the tribes up north, they can't grow it. They can't grow it, but not effectively, not in great quantities. So it becomes a very valuable trade item, right? Because it's a very good tasting corn. Manami look forward to us getting our corn, you know, the way up north and look forward to us getting, making our traditional corn. This guy here is probably sleeping, dreaming about my traditional corn. Right here. So, um, that said, you know, that's just one iota of, you know, the agriculture that take place in here. And if you, you know, Vernon County is, talks about the raised garden beds in this area of old, anything along the Wisconsin River and the Fox River that comes along and comes close to it. Those rain garden beds that was all the way through from Dage Old, but all the way up to through here, this whole area up here. <coughs> There's still remnants of them out there. So those are those items that you can go over there and you put your feet on, right? And, and you can touch them. As if you mount, you go over there and lay on them if you want. But they're proof positive. You know, there was a, a group of people here that culturally were advanced, you know, and did everything we wanted to do and more in order not only to survive, but to excel as a group of people. <clears throat> this ancestral area to talk about right here, those stories that were along this, what I normally do, I should do it back to this, because I had this lady up here, <laughs> arms up in the air. I usually have this 50 foot rope that I forgot to bring. And then this 50 foot rope, I have these strings on here, leather and top, ties on here it tells you those dates on here um, that i kind of mentioned there's two strings over here talks about that period of time those effigy mounds around here 
But then all the way past that, there's these strings. And this all the way back to that last glacier period talks about all the many oral histories and the stories that we have that took place in our area here. Most of it involves environmental change, but some of it talks about the cultural change that had taken place of people coming and going and this, this, and that. And those stories are so phenomenal to tell their children, and hopefully they can pass those stories on. But that rope doesn't change. That same length, one more year. You're going to be surpassed by 2020 next year, I'm sorry to say, lady, but there's going to be a 2020 next year. But those stories on there, they're phenomenal to listen to. You know, certain stories you can talk about, other times you can't talk about in certain years, so there's a way of uh, relaying oral. I think it's, I must have to be closer to this side over here. <laughs> well, that's that. Oh. All right, that's the end of that. <laughs> uh, what I usually do is I use this boot to point because usually I'm in a, a, like a high school or a college university setting and they're, they're their screen is much higher. Um, but this is going to work because I see this has a little boot. <laughs> this has a really cool pointer on it too. So, 1874, who was alive then? No, everybody will look. Yesterday was April Fool's Day, so I used that. Okay, so um, 1800s later on, they realized that you know, it was becoming a very expensive hobby of moving us from Turkey River, right? Up there to, to the Long Prairie, the Blue Earth of Minnesota. But what happened there on that removal period, this little chunk of land had to suffice for a large chunk of land for Ho-Chunk. And by putting them on there, there just wasn't enough room. There. And, and believe it or not, in the 1850s in here, there was also what they called the Sioux Uprising in Minnesota. And after the effect of that and a combination of, oh boy, the neighbors around us realized how good and fertile soil that really was, um, they decided to remove Ho-Chunk one more time. Well, actually what they did in order to get through two years, I think they separated half of it and reduced them onto the other half and opened up the other side of some pioneers coming in. Then after that, the, the growing you know, discontent between in and within the Ho-Chunk were that we have to go back, and most half of them did. The other half were rounded up, and they were all rounded up. The next one of the next springs, they moved them out to um, Crow Creek, South Dakota. And that was a very, very hard thing on the Ho-Chunk people. Uh, we lost you know, quite a few individuals that moved. And uh, you took an agricultural type drive, drive and you put them into a place where there was nothing but tumbleweeds, right? And rocks, and then cottonwoods down on the crib bottoms type stuff. And very uninhabitable. And they'd drop you off and give you a blacksmith shop or the tools for that and a couple of ox. They would tell you, you need to assimilate, become farmers, so that you can be part of our grand nation. So, And that didn't work very well. Right off, so they dropped everybody off. Uh, they began to build those cottonwood trees. This is part of our story. Our, we have to see one of the things I do, I have to document the historical story to pass them on to our kids now. And we talk about how they built those canoes out of the cottonwoods there, and they sailed all the way down, and some of them sought refuge here with the Omaha, where the other ones continued down. They came up each day, and they began to hide out once again. You should write a book, Bill. No. So this canoe ride and all the process and all of those leaving to come back and now you can't. I can drive that probably in a day. Well, that's a, quite a drive, you know. And then then to walk that with no supplies, no real understanding of how to get back into your ancestral areas there. But they did it. And those seeking refuge right there, the Omaha had a reservation already given to them, given to them. They were placed on this reservation here right there, and they sought refuge with him, right? Okay? I've only got an hour here, so I had to tell the story. It's kind of broken up because that same story is what sh the same story that was told by the Menominee up here when they sought refuge at one time, and they resided in an area that this river is called after them. Kahi, we call them, Ravens, right? But it's important to tell that story because the whole chunk, when the sun was rising one day over there, and you look across that water in there, and you can't tell the difference, right, between the water. 
at the sky. It looks the same. And these ravens came flying in from this area here, only to take note of the Ho Chunk residing here, there, and they grew scared and they, they beached their crafts. And they sought refuge in the trees there. And when we sent an entourage of Ho Chunk to see who they were, they ended up being the Manami people coming here seeking refuge from the east or something great that was happening there. And the reason why they received that name Kahi for Ho Chunk, because as they were coming with their canoes along the edge of that shoreline there, you couldn't tell if they were on the water or in the air and their orbs were glistening in this rising sun. And it looked like these big wings of this raven coming. And these ravens, when they sought refuge in these trees, <laughs> that's what the Ho Chunk people call them to this day, Kahi, you know, the ravens. But that story tells the same story over here, the Ho Chunk. Uh, seeking refuge with the Omaha, them talking to their father, you know, the government, asking for them to give them a, ref a place of refuge alongside them. That's what you would normally do, right? But the government took away some of their reservation and, and reduced it and gave the rest of the Winnebago right there. So if you go out there now, there's this phenomenal casino sitting over there, it's the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. There's still our brothers and sisters, relatives, direct. Uh, but they prefer to stay there because they saw refuge there for fear that we were going to be wiped off the face of this earth, right? So you can see the areas of removals that you know, we affected our people back then, and yet we're still here. You know, that I, we have to say when even when we established our government in 1962, I believe it was, yeah. Is there a clock in here? Uh, okay, cool. I'm right on time. <laughs> and so, in 61, now who was alive in 61? There you go. There you go. I gotta tell you, it wasn't long before that. We, we weren't even quite recognized, really, as people, you know. Uh, we didn't have a government established to take care of us, um, but we noticed other tribes in this region over here, the Jibwe and Oneida, and all the ones that they replaced here, right? Oop. I did something there. And, and we wanted to take advantage of some of the federal programs that those tribes are already doing. They established their governments, they're able to take care of Indian health, and housing, all these other different programs were taking place there. And the problem we had though is that my, my ancestors were so bad and they didn't settle down in a reservation. Um, we are now considered an at-large tribe, an allotment type tribe. We don't have a real form of reservation per se that we can say this is where we establish our government, this is what we're going to you know, conduct our government over these people on this reservation land. So we were stuck, you know, and, and I go back to this on here, and I go back to this on here, it talks about you know, the removals, and all of a sudden in 1887, the Homestead Act extended to natives, that Homestead Act is called the Dawes Act. Does anybody know what the Dawes Act is? It was a tool the federal government basically used, in a nutshell, um, to um, create a checkerboarding effect across reservation lands there. Because they knew most reservations didn't have enough heads of households to effectively cover 40 acre lots to suffice to cover that whole reservation. So they created this Homestead Act, or this Dawes Act. I think it started in 81, actually, and uh, they, they made nations and tribal members go over there, put their finger on a map, basically, and say, this 40 acres is mine. If you're ahead of a household, and uh, if you have a large family, I think it is, you get you know 40, 80 acres. But then after all of that land, you know, the, every tribal member that was eligible for that, you know, put their finger on the map. Um, there was a lot of area left open. And that's when that checkerboarding took place. They opened up the rest of those 40s that weren't, you know, claimed and gave it to the public. And the reason behind that is that they found on the reservations, when you take a whole bunch of people, say, oh, if you guys are one clan on here and you come to this room every single day of the week, you're still going to stay together. You're a tight-knit group. But if they took you and put you in all these other houses around here, you only met here one day a week. It, 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 it doesn't allow you to remain strong as a group of people. So in a nutshell, what that was do, done was to do, create you know, a, a division amongst the, the tribal members on these reservations. And, and hopefully they would assimilate into the American way of life a little more. 
we didn't have that luxury and so and yet we are exempt from that process like it says here the no official reservation but there was some special legislation that was created in wisconsin and and that change in the air up there i'm going to use this before the end of the night a change in the air so <laughs> so the change in the air took place and they said well we can't keep chasing ho chunk back onto these reservations. And there there were other things at work there. We had certain families that were going to bat for us at the state level and at federal level. You know, you'll hear the term of Spaulding's and all these other names that grew sensitive. If you read between the lines, that sensitivity goes back to where, well, we need people working in our cranberry marshes and our cutting our pulp and this and that. And there's just no cheap labor. But I didn't say that, camera. <clears throat> Long story short, there was a sensitivity that took place there. So then they allowed the whole chunk to come to Wisconsin, those living here, and if you could prove that you're head of household, you got this American name, right? Now Chuck E. J. Well, my name was Bill Quackenbush, and I had a family. I could go put my finger on that and say map. It's, this isn't a real map, this is just a figurative map. And make a claim. And so there was 13, I think, counties that allow that allowed this to take place. But the land that was left for the tribal members were lands that was unfit for farming or unfit for anything on it, really. If you go to Hoka, Minnesota, or go to Minnesota, and all the land the tribal members got there is on those ridges and the, the steep inclines up to them, really. That's the land they got. The land that was got in Wisconsin is mostly all that the head, headwaters of, you know, and the sandy plains areas, places where you couldn't farm anyway, so that's the land that was left. And that's what we got today. And the good thing about that, though, is now the federal government, state governments, agencies, are once again interested in the whole chunk and what we're doing on our lands, because now they find, oh, we stuck them in our headwaters. That's bad, because we say everything flows down the hill, right? <laughs> So they want to know if we're doing Clear Water Act processes and this is an that. So you know, this in part helps us become good neighbors again too. That interagency process. Uh, the whole thing, you know, these homesteads, you know, that were turned over to the local governments due to taxation and stuff, took place. You know, they were supposed to hold this land in the trust for perpetuality for the whole people. Twenty-five years went, and they gave the process over to the local municipalities who began to tax these properties. And if we have tribal members back then who basically lived, you know, in subsistence, you know, subsistence on just the property alone, cut some pulp, pull some moss. I'm left-handed, that's why I'm having this issue. I'll blame, I'll blame it later. So, the, the issue that was taking place then is that they lost a lot of their land base even after the fact that they were gifted this land for a period of time because uh, the nation's people at that time were still not able to live in today's society. You know, back in that period of time, you didn't send kids to school. You put them in boarding schools to teach them the American way of life. But you never hired them. They never ran businesses. They didn't do anything. They, after they left, they'd go back to you know, living hand to mouth, if you want to use that term. And they lost a lot of land because the taxes weren't paid. In 34, the whole chunk leaders, uh, they began to talk to the BIA, BIA regarding uh, this Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA, they call it there. And long story short, it took quite a, lot of, a while, but the nation then began to organize, and as a lot of our, my Great father, grandfathers, and mothers got together. Um, they organized and they created. They created this uh, Wisconsin Winnebago Business Committee in '62. Uh, they created a, a constitution that was recognized, and they were allowed to um, have their first first uh, elections there. And they established a government in '63. And and '63 isn't that, oh, and that's that's when the first of our government right then. Um, the general elections took place, and, but then we realized that they created a name here that really isn't who we are on here. We've been called that so much and beat down so much uh, that it, it actually made it into the name of our tribal government, and they realized it was wrong. So in 94, they uh, went and changed the name officially from the Winnebago Business Committee to the Ho-Chunk Nation, 
which I'm selling the nation of Wisconsin. This is how that is. So. <clears throat> Old seal, still looking for one on the cloth. I can't find any uh, for our archives. And then we change it to our new seal. And so is Sovereign Nation, you know, the people of the big voice. Remember that? Uh, we had this preamble that we use to this day, you know, the pursuant to our inherent sovereignty in order to form a more perfect government, secure our rights, advance the general welfare, safeguard our interests, and sustain our culture, promote our traditions, and perpetuate our existence. That's kind of why I do this educational outreach, this sustain our culture. Because <clears throat> if you don't use it, you lose it. And secure our natural and self-evident right to govern ourselves, to ordain and establish this constitution for the little chunk nation. It's one simple little paragraph. I'm sure they templated off something else. Who knows? Um, but it it's, stands the test of time. This is stand. We had our 50-year anniversary not so long ago, but it's 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 funny how fast time goes. And so. But I use this to some effect on here, even within our own tribal members. Uh, when I, I said this was updated in 2019, actually 7,800 7, is who we have on here. Uh, talks about you know how we created ourselves and our land base encompasses what are known as states, of course. Uh, we have approximately 15,000 acres of fee simple, right? Tax paying land. We pay taxes on just like anybody else on there because we acquire lands around our few little tribal trust lands there to give them buffers and assist us in, in giving back to our tribal or constituents, right? Um, things they need, the environment around them to protect and preserve them. Uh, we have 2,890 acres of trust. Do you know where 1,200 acres of that is? Right, Kickapoo Valley Reserve. We only gained that in 1990. So half of that came within the last few years. Pretty incredible, right? Um, so we're working right now in in establishing a long-term range land management for Mount Walkinchunk, they call that, the former Badger property. Mount Walkinchunk is the name that it now is called because we formally changed the name of that land from Badger Animal on our tribal trust lands to Sacred Earth. And it's sacred to us because it's contiguous to the Sacred Lake, Devil's Lake, right? I always talk about Spirit Lake and the Sacred Lake, but you don't ever hear it. Uh, maybe someday before I die, that name will be changed back to Sacred Lake versus Devil's Lake. <clears throat> we use our lands to great effect. It does. You know, there's not that much land for 7,800 people, right? And we have to kind of cover the base for all of our tribal uh, needs. You know, we do agriculture. You know, land we purchase initially as agricultural land, we continue to ag it for a while until we get those fields, you know, back to shape in order to turn it or defer it over into restoration, for example. Kickapoo Valley Reserve, you know, sitting on a joint management uh, practice there and being on the board there, we, we took the steps right off the bat, you know, to go above and beyond what the state does. And the reason we did that is because those minimal things the state is required to meet, you know, still is, it might work in a very slow, long process, but it's slower than what Mother Earth likes. So we increase the buffers, for example, you know, on the waterways, right? Increase the wooded area, you know, and the areas that we farm from the stream areas. Uh, it was highly erodible land, HEL, right, in, in the FSA book. Uh, we decided to take it right out of the egg program whatsoever, you know, all the way and create restoration, which is another form of agriculture. So, <clears throat> um, when I was talking about that highly erodible land, you know, and, and how this earth has shaped itself, you know, um, I'm talking about that glacier that was way back there. And the lady, is she still standing against that wall? No. <laughs> you should put the hand on the least now, huh? But, there's a story that goes when that glacier was receding. Um, and it was told by that very same individual. His name was Jim Funmaker. And I'm going to go back to this map right here. And the reason I go back to this map uh, here, because it's important for people to know, you know, our history here as mankind. You know? And the stories that are told are very accurate. And it, 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 it's hard to change those stories. 
because they are told in a certain way that there's a redundancy process in place. It's, it's a little different than if I whispered into this lady's ear and she whispered into this, and it goes all around the room, and by that, that story gets to that lady over there, it'd be completely different, right? That's a game, you know? But that, that isn't how oral history is passed on. Oral history, we even tell the same things, you know? We do the same thing. What do you do with your children? If I said Jack and Jill went up the hill, what's the next line? Right on, and that's just been green in your head from infancy on, infancy on. And you'll probably carry that to your grave. That same story, fetch the pale water. And the whole chunk, we have a process of telling a story and there's a redundancy process in place. And in those lodges of old, in those long houses, in those medicine lodges, or even in the family lodge, the Chipotle case, they call them Chipotle case. You know, you know Chippewa, and they call them, and the Gonquins, you know, wigwams. You always hear the term wigwams, you know. And, and every time I talk about, oh, would you live in wigwams? And I go, no, we didn't live in wigwams. We lived in what we call Chipotle case. Chitty means home, and Puroke means round like my belly. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that, but it means round dwelling area. <clears throat> and in that family dwelling is where a lot of your oral history. Get in. <laughs> There's a siren out there. Okay. But the history was told in that family setting there because you had your great grandparents and your grandparents, your parents, and your children, and their grandchildren. And it has always been, ever since we can remember, these stories from being here, our elders teach us and teach our children. And so of Choka, my grandfather, who would be sitting in here, and I have my children sitting here listening to him tell stories in the wintertime over this fire, right? He'd be saying that story. Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? That story. And if he said to fetch a Ford, I would be forced to say growing up. No, no, Choka, that's not how that's told. It's Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. And then Choka then be forced to say, oh, yes, that's right. And you have to restart the whole story and tell the story accurately until it's told accurately. And those children hearing that and the parents hearing that assure us that those stories are told. And that's one form of oral history being passed on. Another thing where stories are told are all through this glacier area, right through all Roach Oak Tree, all the way down through here, through the Driftless area, you have this this rock art. Everybody's oh my god. You got books of it. And Irony, I think in part helped write this hidden thunder or whatever that book was there with a rock art through here. And so a lot of people say, well they didn't have written history, but I gotta tell you, we had a much more easier way of telling history. Like I mentioned earlier, this picture, you know, says a thousand words, and those pictures say thousands, about thousands of words. Jim Funmaker took us a place over here by Rojo Cree and the Dunn Schools Cave, locked in there, several of us there. And, and there was a couple more of them, Red Cloud and others, and he's bent over like this. And he, well, if he was only this tall. You know Jim Funmaker? He's a little this tall right here, standing up on his toes. So when he bent over, he almost went out of sight. He's down here by this rock, though. And he's putting his hand on the scene, he's dusting it all off of there, and sure enough, there was a crack in there that was covered up, and he's in there. Oh, it's huge So he's talking about, you know, this is certain things that goes on in here. There should be another one around the hill. And so when we go up there, myself and Bill King Swan go up there, and sure enough, there is this little hole in the side of a rock. You have to climb up these big rocks to get there. And so we go in there. And uh, that was back when, it was before, you know, social media was really big. But I would take pictures of everything we did on there, so I had to archive them away. And there's a picture of Bill squirting down into that hole. And I was just a little bigger than him at the time, so I was really reluctant to go in there. But he gets to the other end and says, yeah, everything's fine. And Jim says, you can't go in there. You can't go in there. And Bill says, well, I'm, you know, it's okay if you just take a peek out, but don't bring anything out if you see anything in there. Because on that stone down there is telling them that's only where this these people have a certain right to go into medicine, medicine and are seeking you know you know direction in this fasting site. And he goes and crawls in there, and uh, yeah, everything's fine. And I get in there, and I kid you not, I had this little phone light, and I I could barely push my way through, and I didn't know it was getting smaller or not. 
So, but I managed to get in there. We stood up right, and I'm standing there, and, and there's this wall there, and it's all black soot from his, the ashes of that. You can see some old corn stuff, you know, corn. Uh, what do they call them? That the the ears were in there, and that's what they were using to burn in there too. And there's a lot of this stuff laying around there. And yet, there, Bill says this is amazing. He's showing and he's trying to mentally catch what he was saying, but it doesn't take good pictures. It's all black charcoal, right? And red ochre and stuff. You can't take a good picture. So he comes back out of there, and I was just lucky to get out of there. <clears throat> and so then we get back down, and Jim says. That was amazing. They had all this kind of rock art on there. He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, that's telling a certain story so that he can take his people that they bring up and rear and tell a story. So then uh, we come down and we go back in there. And he says, well, there's another one over here. And it was, it was a private property. And he says, well, in here, this is a story. And on this rock in there, there's these big cuts in them right here and here. And he could barely reach out like that. And they were receding, 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 and they had these pecked out animals, those mastodons. I was telling you about those big, giant, short faced bear, and these animals here, and these other animals are coming in, are replacing them. And as that glacier was receding, the story, same story he told us, has to be told the same way. As he run his hand out of there, he's talking now, telling the story he learned as a kid, going in there listening to his elders. And as he was telling them, he said, We need to come back here sometime. So we can tell the story the right way to him. He's a hero. Well, we never went back to that story yet. He passed away. Um, but this place is still there. It'll be there for who knows how long, right? It stands the test of time, though. You know, and that's what they felt would have been a good thing for him to do. So I, I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you one story. Is that okay with you guys? Don't charge me for this. So I talked about that glacier period back there and this same guy, Jim Femaker. I wish he was here to talk to you. He would be able to tell this so much more. You know, he would have the ability to tell the story in a much better way. The um, glacier, when it was receding on here, it had shaped our environment to such a degree. Our ancestors told us there stories about that, okay? <clears throat> The FSA, or NRCS here from Vernon County. I think it's from Pulpa. His name was Jim Ranke. Anybody know him? Mm -hmm. All right, great, excellent. Then I'm not going to use this story. No. <laughs> <laughs> he came up to the Ho Chunk and asked them, You guys always say that you always you know, been here for a long time. We have this issue, this situation, I guess I should say, where we're trying to figure out the, how, how this so certain soil series was placed here or had developed or been created here. And uh, when he came to us, we didn't really know. But in the process, though, of all people, Bill King Swan and I was sitting in the little area of our environmental resources offsite. We used to work in our environmental resources area. And so here's Jim. He comes walking into his little box, and there was a little snake in it. And he's just fit to be tied. Oh, hey, Junji, hey, look at this. He goes, this thing's not supposed to be here. What is going on? He goes, like, this, this earth is changing. He goes, this snake's going to be here. He says, there's birds laying dead along the roads. You know, the things are changing so fast. He says, we need to do something about it. We need to tell somebody about that. And we're like, <laughs> you know, we should have that all, you know? And so I said, well, we'll take note of it. We're pushing that snake around there because I think Jim killed it almost. <laughs> and uh, he said, I, said, I said, do you want me to take that down south again and get rid of it or something? He goes, no, no, I'm just using this to tell you a story, you know, how Jim is. And so then uh, there's Jim Rackey talking to Dave. Um, Dave, uh, I can't remember his last name. He used to be our forester. And Richie Brown and a few others there at the time. And so... As we were leaving, I, they said to Jim, I says, is there anything that you know that took place in here that would, that would assist in, in finding out why the soil series was the way it is? And Jim is good as like any other good author. He doesn't want to tell you something unless he knows for positive it's going to be accurate, right? Or give you information. If they don't know, they're not going to tell you, right? He says, well, I'll, I'll have to think about it a little bit. Well, the next Monday, we went over to traditional courts, and he, by the way, wasn't on our traditional courts, but we had other tribal members of traditional courts on there. And our traditional courts are made up of our tribal clan leaders. 
um, respectively. And they represent their clans on this this 12 body, you know, traditional courts. So they said, you know, on average, this is about 800 years of experience sitting here you're talking to. So when you go into traditional courts and you ask them a question, they're going to give you advice after a lot of thought and a lot of discussion amongst themselves and a little chunk there. Their answers are usually short and quite curt, but it's pretty precise. And so we went in there to ask this, and they give us an answer. And so uh, they thought about it a little bit, they thought about it a little bit, but it was one of those things come back, right? They want to talk about it a little bit. And uh, as we were walking out, though, here was Jim in the parking lot, up walking in there. Oh, you know, I got that story. I says, he says, he said, you want me to tell you that story? He says, we should take our little ride. And so, we're, we're, you know, in short, Jim Funmaker, he tells this story, this that's the name, the title of the story. It's when the ice stopped the flow of the water for a period of time. What happened, in short, the ice that was coming off from this draking off in shards, it came down. And right there, for a while, created this ice dam. And when he created that ice dam, the water had to go back up the Wisconsin River for a period of time. And when it was going up the Wisconsin River for a period of time, right here, um, it eventually became a, a large pool of water. You always hear about the glacier lake. But for a period of time, there was a lake that was created right here. And our ancestors sitting on all these bluffs that you guys love farming today out here and stuff was watching this unfold. And as eventually that ice broke away and the water began to return and go there, well then this is what you have today. You know, the river systems and the coolies and this and that, because all that water kind of has to go somewhere. They talk about a story of them sitting here where you look three ways and all you see is ice. And you don't see ice almost and you don't see the sun until midday. That's a lot of ice. It's a little different than your glacier. You go up north, you know, Canada, Alaska, and you see this pile of ice coming down between two hills. This was a little different than that. This was a big chunk of ice that was creating something and making something. And all that water had to go somewhere. It, and it came through here. So anyway, so he says that's Nuk Maruch Khanifate story. He tells the story. And that Jim Rackey, he said, well, that's incredible. And they went down here to Richland, and they cut a series of soils out, and there's this gray strip on there this day, and they did an analysis on that, and sure enough, the, the minerals or whatever it is in that soil could only come from, of course, this area up here, mixed with an area of St. Croix up here, and those combination of soils came in here sat in that water and saturated down and created that. And so that's where that mystery was somewhat solved. Pretty cool, right? So, that said, it, it's the way where science now backs up our oral stories and vice versa. Because not only did Jim thought that, think that was pretty cool, if you look in the, I think it is, uh, Richland County's Soil Series books there, they named that Soil Series after Jim Funmaker's name, Nuhma the soil series, and it's in their book. So it's kind of nice to take those archaeologists and whatever ologists, and, and they pick up all these stones around here and say, oh man, this guy is 12,000 years old. You know, this is 10,000 years old. And you can take these stones and lay them right up on here nowadays, and you can see the transition of the humans who adapted in this area, because if they didn't adapt, we would have ceased to exist, right? We would die right alongside those mass animals. If we didn't know how to live off on these little, um, you know, more fleet of foot animals over here. When the oak first came into this area there, we recognize that. We still to this day, the white oak is a sacred tree to us because it gives us something, something that we didn't have before, the sustenance of life, these acorns, right? We still regard that as a sacred tree. You know, they're the hairs of mother earth. <laughs> As those came into here, our stories that talk about them puts us in that place and time. If you went and did a soil series of these areas here where the glacier went back there and found out when Donnie, 
right? Tobacco was first gifted to us. It's no longer there because that ice removed it. And there was red banks that we call that are no longer there because that glacier removed all those tall red banks. But if you go back up into that area, you see still see remnants where the water ran, runs blood red. Those streams along there, in fact, comes out of that clay of soil. And so our oral history, you know, for this area places us here. An archaeologist come here in a couple of weeks and says, yeah, you're talking about a very short period of time. Those effigy mounds are about this long right out here. You should talk about the history of all of us, our ancestors, right? All of us, all the way back to these last periods of time here that now today's science shows that we were here. Anyway, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I'll just have to leave room for more, right? <laughs> and so I'll be back in about a half an hour. You guys going to move. So. Other than that, that's all I have. Thank you, folks. Thank you.